Okay, this half of the room is doing really well. And this half of the room, some of you are really good. Could you please take your seats? Can I get someone to close the doors? Thank you. Shh. I feel like I'm your auntie telling you to shh. Good job, good job over here on this side of the room. Good job. You're following our dear elders' example. Appreciate it. All of you, thank you. Thank you. We are so close, people. This is the home stretch. We're digging her down, we're almost there. So to wrap us up, well, this isn't the wrap up. This is your opportunity to give feedback into the way forward. This is like the whole reason we're all here for these last two wonderful days. So to start us off, am I saying your name right? Niall. Niall? Um, we have Dr. Niall O'Day, the Associate Assistant Deputy Minister, Canadian Wildlife Service, Environment and Climate Change Canada. How to get all that on a card? And of course, Miles Richardson needs no introduction. But we'll start start with the good doctor. Thank you, Leah. I guess my previous request not to be called doctor doesn't apply. Um, but appreciate uh, the introduction, um, and and thank you everyone uh, for uh, for bearing with us. It's been a fantastic uh, couple of days, and. Uh, um, glad to be here with uh, with Miles for the closing. I thought we had a, a quick uh, confab on how to, how to approach the the, um, the closing element of this, and thought it'd be best for for me to offer a few remarks first, and then um, um, Miles will talk to, uh, to a little bit further to the way forward, and then we'll kind of open it for a few uh, a few more questions and thoughts if people have those to offer. Um, so uh, this last session is about uh, looking at, at the way forward, um, so how we move uh, from uh, this, uh, this stage of the initiative to the kind of the broader vision ahead. Um, I, I would say out of the starting blocks that uh, I hesitate um, to offer uh, my own vision or to offer a federal vision um, because if this is to be uh, indigenous-led, uh, it's not our role to set the vision. Um, rather, it's for us to understand the vision and and to help to to chart a way forward. And that the 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 role um, that that we've played in the joint working group uh, and in, and in this early stage of the programming is is really around trying to do that. So it's trying to build that understanding within a federal system, and I know we're not always easy to work with, um, but to, to build an understanding within the federal system of, of how this kind of, of initiative can be um, can be grown and expanded in a way that, that gives it the kind of long-term sustainability that I think um, many speakers, particularly in the last session, uh, spoke to, and, and we're, we're looking to, uh, to support that in the, in the best way we can. Um, I, I really feel privileged to have had the time to, to, to spend here these uh, these past few days as part of this gathering. Um, sadly, I rarely get to spend two whole days uh, doing anything, but I'm really uh, glad I had the opportunity to do it here with you. Um, through the rich panel discussions and also the many informal chats I've had uh, with folks, 
uh, at the table while eating, even while dancing. Um, I've heard uh, much that is uh, that's really inspiring, and and a couple of uh, uh, themes uh, clearly uh, emerge for me. So I'm just, and I, I'm not kind of owning the summary of this event. I'm just saying this is what what I heard, and I hope I've in that spirit of listening uh, and hearing. I hope I've I've heard it right. Um, and I think the first um, is uh, the deep connection between guardianship uh, and identity, uh, whether that's for, for individual people, um, as in uh, Jarrett's compelling um, story that he so compellingly relayed, um, or uh, in identity and in respect of community and in respect of, of nationhood, which I know um, Miles will speak to far more eloquently than I would ever attempt to. Um, I hear the, the importance of, of reconnection to land and the strong in interest in reclaiming responsibility and authority for its stewardship uh, and the pride that's connected to that. So um, the second uh, is um, theme I hear is the value that guardianship offers in uh, strengthening our collective stewardship of, of lands and resources. Um, hearing the presentations and talking to individual guardians about their work, uh, I see an enormous opportunity to both intensify and improve our understanding of the land, uh, which we all know climate change and other factors are rapidly uh, transforming, but also to strengthen the capacity to, to care for it, um, whether that be fisheries management, oil spill response, um, or wildlife monitoring and conservation. I think there's, um, there's clearly uh, enormous value here and it speaks to that, that uh, question of, um, you know, there's value to communities, but there's also enormous value to, um, to us in a, kind of, in a nation to nation relationship to look at how uh, we can work together and leverage our, our respective strengths to, uh, to see ultimately conservation of, of, of nature uh, and uh, uh, be advanced in a more uh, effective way. Um, third, uh, I hear loud and clear uh, that there's a strong need for long-term sustainable support for Guardians uh, initiatives. Um, and uh, the, that's the, the case we hope to build through the pilot initiative. Uh, and I recognize through the many um, initiatives ongoing and in parallel and that have been ongoing for, for a long time. So if, if I can offer any kind of conception of the pilot for, for us, it's around taking all of that work that has existed, the work that's being done through the pilot itself, and to connect that into uh, where we can the, the um, logic of, of federal decision making um, so that we can, uh, we can really, uh, with you, make that case uh, to, to get long-term funding support under this in, in a manner that allows uh, these in, in the individual programs and initiatives to, to realize their, their full potential and, and to have that happen in an indigenous-led context. Um, and to achieve that, to achieve that long-term sustainable um, support, we are committed to working in a new way. And I know that takes time. Um, uh, and uh, I think we're looking at doing that through a different kind of partnership uh, with Indigenous peoples um, and the both the pilot initiative and the Joint Federal Working Group um, are, are kind of for us flagships of that of that new way of, of working. Um, I think the Government of Canada recognizes the importance of a National Indigenous Guardians uh, Network for First Nations to support the expansion of First Nations Guardians programs across Canada, um, as well as the um, phenomenal work and advocacy that, that Val and the ILI more broadly uh, have done uh, to, to get us where we, where we are um, today. I mean, really do uh, appreciate that. Um, and understanding that we're in initiating uh, that, that network and looking at, towards doing that in the months to come, uh, the government is hoping to promote a network that will allow knowledge sharing among First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, uh, as, uh, and also to create connections among communities. Uh, so in doing that, we can create a shared platform to access that wealth of knowledge and to talk to some of the, the training needs uh, that uh, we discussed in the last session, while also uh, ensuring that that knowledge can be shared as broadly as possible and continue to grow. Um, we know we'll continue to have uh, challenges as, as we continue. Um, 
and I think most things that are worth working on have that dimension. Um, but thankfully, we have the opportunity now to move forward on implementation uh, of, of this initiative, and I think that will give us a solid uh, basis on, on which to move forward. Um, and certainly, you have my support and that of the, the team uh, within the Canadian Wildlife Service, and I know the members of the Joint Working Group, uh, to help uh, navigate um, through those next steps. And I think together we can really uh, continue to build on that dialogue and collaboration and also on you know, our understanding of how, how uh, best to, to, uh, to advance this. Um, so that's, that's really all I wanted to say. I did also want to say sincerely appreciate uh, my, um, the Coast Salish First Nations for um, welcoming us here on your traditional territory. Uh, it's been a unique opportunity um, for, for me and for, for our team and uh, we really appreciate that. And uh, I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank the, the First Nations Federal Joint Working Group for Guardians for the tremendous work um, that, that they've uh, put in. And we'll, at the end of the session, come back um, to, to Julie and Loretta, who wanted to do an acknowledgement uh, of their own. So when we come to the conclusion of this session, we'll, we'll return uh, to that. But uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and, and um, it's been a long day, I know that, and, and sounds like a federal five minutes is almost as long as a height of five minutes, so I'm going to be, <laughs> I'll, I'll be easy on you. And I, I got tagged with this, if you see on the agenda, Val Courtois, our director, was on the agenda to do this, but I was humbly giving her some advice on what to say, and she says, well, you do it then. <laughs> so. So here I am. <laughs> so I, in closing, I know this is the closing session for the forum, and to me it's really important. We're talking about the way forward, the next steps forward. And, and I want to um, just keep to the point, keep it simple. I want to tell you three things. One, I want to recap who the ILI is and, and um, how we ended up advocating a Guardians Network initiative. Two, I want to talk about our experience in building that network, in advocating with the federal government through the um, national gathering last year to getting us here today. And third, and I think most importantly, in talking about the way forward, that there's three general things that we need to do as we leave here today. First is to build on our concept paper, which lays out our approach to the National um, Guardians Network, which is on our website and outlines our proposals for governance, that after this discussion here and after the work that the, your Guardians programs have done through the Joint Working Group. We're going to bring that concept paper up to date as, as options for going forward. Frank and Keith just presented an option around, around um, training, education and training. And there'll be other options that are put together and presented to you. And that will that, that will begin, I think, over the next few months. And then we'll, we'll, we'll move into the second phase of follow-up from what we need to do here. And that, that's what's coming very clearly to be 10 regional dialogues. The Assembly of First Nations has been very supportive of this process and has the BC Assembly of First Nations has co-sponsored this gathering here and have been very supportive of this initiative. Right now we're looking at conducting regional dialogues across the country of all 
the Guardian's programs on the ground in the 10 regions of the AFN, which are essentially provinces and territories. Now that is an expensive undertaking, and as I'll explain in a minute, we have no budget for it. We thought the $25 million, we thought that was the purpose of it, but it hasn't worked out that way. And, and the, third, um, the third stage will be once those regional consultations are a accomplished to come together and um, compile a business case, a business plan, a business case, if you will, in this instance, for the original ask that we took forward a year and a half ago, which was for $500 million for a National Guardians initiative, based on the input that, that you have given to this initiative. Now, we see that the first phase of what I just said and the third phase, originally we wanted that whole process to be about five million of the 25 million. That was our intention, that the pilot was to develop a business case, the minister agreed with us. The purpose of the pilot was to develop a business case for our original ask, to put in all the details of what we agreed on for a National Guardians Network, what we would do, how we would measure progress, and how we would conduct those things. And that was the original purpose, but things went off the rails. And as you've heard in some of the discussion around the joint working group. So the, the two, those two phases before the regional consultation as, in, as after, we've rejigged our budget and we think we can do that phase for $500,000 and do the regional consultations for a million and a half. That's what the meeting organizers tell us it's gonna cost to pull together those consultations. So that brings that $5 million original projection down to two million. And that's really the road forward is those three phases. And when we get done with that, about next fall, we'll have a business plan, a business case to fit into the, the budget process. And th that's really the same process that we used to get us here. So that's $2 million, 1.5 for the regional consultations and compiling the info and input on either side of that. Based on the concept paper that's on the, the Guardians, um, the ILI, the Guardians Network website. Let me go back to point one, the ILI. The ILI is a group who got together and as you heard, the two, um, uh, Michael Scott and Steve Kallick from their found respective foundations have believed in indigenous-led conservation and their, their foundations have financed the work of building the Guardians Network. There's no government money involved in the ILI's involvement those, that group believed that if they were going to meet and work to meet their conservation objectives, their best bet was to support indigenous people. And of course, we insisted that if they were going to do that, they, they simply support us. They support our nations, they support our nationhood and work through our authority. And the reason that I was giving them accolades, I mean, I'm not used to doing that to these guys, but you know, it's been a pretty rough road, but Ovid still, I mean, they still run when they see Ovid, but um, <laughs> what they said in this panel this afternoon was, I think, was very good, the right thing about supporting indigenous people, supporting our nationhood, helping us develop that work through it, not doing it for us, but trusting that we're the, our authority and our people's ability are the best bet to get there and that's what they've been doing. So we began with the indigenous leadership working on indigenous protected areas. We had a common objective with these financers and that had gone on for a couple of years and then 
an idea came up. I think it was um, Dave Porter's idea initially that observed the Guardians networks that were emerging across the country and said, why don't we, why don't we make this a, a national coalition, a national network of nations with their Guardians program? And lo and behold, um, the Prime Minister stands up and says, I am committed to a nation-to-nation -nation relationship, a proper nation-to-nation -nation relationship. And we said, voila, what a better place to implement, to, to, to actualize and implement that relationship in a constructive way than responsible stewardship of territory. You know, we got pipelines and all these things that we're inevitably going to battle about, but with Canada, First Nations could agree on a, on a conservation agenda. So the process began of seeing, developing a, a concept led by the ILI and bringing it to the federal government. And immediately, there was a lot of interest. And we were really clear with them. And Val and her team, they, she brought us in just you know, when she met with cabinet ministers and stuff. But they did, like I was saying yesterday, over 200 meetings on Parliament Hill and across the country. We had parliamentary committees up in, on little boats chugging around Haida Gwaii and up in Delaney and all over the country. But at the end of that process, which we insisted on nation-to-nation -nation relationships, we laid out this vision and listened to them you know, in the course of this, right away our ask was for 500 million and it was a really rich discussion. I remember sitting down with Scott Bryson, who was then the Treasury Board Minister, and him getting excited about reading the Australian um, reports on performance indicators. I mean, the President of the Treasury Board would love to, if he's gonna justify this $500 million investment, figuring out indicators that were credible, where he could go into Parliament and say, look Canadians, look at how good you've done. You've invested a dollar in the National Guardians Network and it saved you five dollars from other things. You heard Coastal First Nations yesterday saying they could make the case that that was, you saved ten dollars for every dollar spent. But we were having a really strong discussion with the federal government. So fast forward through the summer, we convinced, we persuaded Canada's Environment and Sustainability Committee and the Finance Committee to recommend the Guardians Network to be financed at $500 million. So it goes into the budget process and it comes out a year and a half ago, $25 million. I was choked. You know, that was like making fun of us. $25 million is not close. And, you know, we, so anyway, we went up to the minister's office that day that they announced it. And, you know, there's a group in there, well-meaning people, but they're building a trail across Canada. They got $25 million too. You know, this is not that big a deal. But, we sat down with the minister and said, look, if you can agree to two principles, this is a beginning. We'll take this as a beginning, as you say. If you can agree that we're going to build this Guardians Network in support and in the spirit of your government's commitment to implementing a nation-to-nation -nation relationship with every nation across this country, and secondly, that we do this in partnership, and she was all over it, saying, of course I can agree to those two things. Nation to nation's our policy, and if we're going to do it in partnership, I can go better than that. Why don't you hold the pen? You guys hold the pen. You write the, the implementation. Okay, we said, great, we're going to give this a try. We're going to give this a shot. We're going to make that $25 million work. So nation to nation is a tough they don't know what it means, you know, that's their policy, but, but you know, that's okay, because we need to tell them what it means. So we sat down and we started framing out. That $25 million went to four ministries. 
We had the political staff and the administrative staff, two levels at each, for four ministries at the minister's staff level, four ministries at the admin level. I was skeptical. I've been through the Aboriginal fisheries strategy experience already that I told you about. I went in there and, and you know, with the, the political staff were very political. They were good. They were fleshing out an approach to a nation-to-nation -nation relationship for a Guardians Network. The administrative staff, I went into those meetings with guns blazing and because that's what happened in fisheries. And I remember one meeting, Val leaning over and says, Miles, give them a chance. They're agreeing with you. But they were amazing, amazingly flexible at the administrative level. So we're fleshing out how we're going to do a business case for the 500 million, how we're going to select a number of pilot. We had 30 Guardians programs that existed across the country. We're going to select a, a, a rep, you know, from across the country a few that were in existence and some new ones so that we could get a good cross-section and a good pilot. And things were going well. And then the minister changed her mind. She decided that time was getting short and she needed to get that money out the door. They were the ones who were causing the delays. We were being available as we wanted to move this forward quickly. Anyway, um, next thing you know, they haven't even had staff yet and they're, out, they're allocating the first allocation. Never talked to us one bit. That $25 million was still intact. First she came to us and said, we're going to take the distinctions-based approach. First Nations get a chunk, Inuit get a chunk, Métis get a chunk. Val will tell you what those breakups were, 50, 30, and 20 percent of that 25 million. So now we're down to um, 12 and a half million. And they totally kept a grip on that money. They started, they didn't even have a policy, they didn't have a process. People, we encouraged people to send in their proposals because we didn't know what was going to happen. And next thing you know, they set up a three and a half million dollar bureaucracy with our money for their officials. And th that was just too much. So, um, and we sat down twice with the minister, I personally did, and said, look, I'm reminding you of the commitments you made to nation to nation and partnership. Oh, I still agree with that. I'll communicate with my staff. Okay, we're going to fix it. We were patient. Second time, we're going to fix it. And, um, you know, by then there's no credibility. There's, uh, they've totally abandoned. And she sent one of her staff to a meeting, and, and a senior staff, who said to us, there's no, there's no partnership. Everything that happens in Ottawa is a program. So, you know, pretty uh, hopeless situation by then. But Val, in her wisdom, took up their offer that we'd made at the minister's table and set up and continued to push for a joint working group. They were spending the money. They'd set up their bureaucracy. I didn't know what this joint working group was going to do. I still don't know what they're going to do. I listened to them. Frank is very diplomatic. He's doing very good, Frank Brown. He's one of the leaders on that joint working group. So now we'll let that play out. And we, he we hear Niles' commitments. Niles is saying they're there to listen. They're there to figure out how to make this nation-to-nation -nation process work. So that money's gone. Hopefully every one of you got lots. We don't know who, that we had nothing to do with that. But, um, so that 25 million's gone, we're, we're looking now to raise our own money on behalf of the First Nations to do those three phases that I just laid out for two million dollars. So how fast we move on that, how many regional consultations we're gonna have will depend 
on how much money we can raise in each region. And we're going to ask the AFN, we're going to ask the, the provincial governments to kick in. We're going to ask industry to kick in. You heard the Mining Association up here, and there's many of them who have expressed interest in making this work. And um, we're, we're just going to tack this together and make it work. But we need to have those three steps done by fall by soon, early fall after the summer so that we can get this clearly for the $500 million ask into the um, budget cycle. I think the, you know, I mean, I know you're beginning, I'm beginning to paint a picture of me being an idiot. What do they say? What, what's, the, what's the definition of an idiot? Someone who keeps doing the same thing and expects a different result, but, um, I think we got to keep, keep that option out there, but here's what's going to make the difference. The only thing we have control over is building the relationships, and that includes governance amongst ourselves, and the protocols amongst ourselves as nations. And we focus on those, and we treat each other as nations, we respect each other's authority in our territories. We decide what it is we're going to do together. We decide how we're going to support each other. And we develop that according to our means. We leave the door open to partnerships. We're going to continue to offer Canada a partnership. But it's, it's on these terms of nation to nation. And if the joint working group can figure this out, then we can bring that investment forward into the, the decision-making process you agree to in the Guardian's network and invest in Guardian's programs across the country. If we can't get there, then Canada will probably set up a little program and everybody can line up and do what they do. It won't have much to do with the network, but the network's work will continue. And you saw yesterday the, the Premier of BC was here. He and his team are very interested in the potential of Guardians in BC. I know they're interested in the Northwest Territories. I know they're interested in the Yukon. There's no reason that we can't build these relationships right across the country. And um, when, when, she, when she looks at me like that, I know I gotta <laughs> shut up. But you get the picture. That's, uh, you know, I've, I've laid that out. I think it's, I think I, if you, I, know, I hope you have questions. Um, the question earlier about A-based funding, you know, we've gotta have, what we, in the concept paper, which is on the website, if you read that, the governance process for the Guardians Network is the highest authority is in the, the nation, in their territory, on the ground. That's what everything is leading toward. That's the highest priority. The regional affiliations are working together for economies of scale, for training opportunities, for those types of things at a regional level. The national table will just be to take to set standards, but to distribute money as directly as we can through a, a, an agreed process, directly as we can to the programs on the ground. 500 million is not gonna finance, is not enough to do these programs, but it's a darn good start. And if Canada can take that step, we can get there with this. So thank you for your patience, and, and I hope we have time for some questions. Thank you, gentlemen, for your presentations. I would just like to point out that the um, Haida Gwaii has more in common with the federal government in terms of timing than they know. <laughs> just saying. Now, Miles has given you a lot of information, and some of you, most of you, have looked at all of the paper that you were given in your handout, and I know the gent over in the corner caught the 2.8 million that Canada was keeping for the Secretariat. 
And you heard a little bit more about um, the ideas going forward and how, how, um, how you would build upon the concept paper that Frank um, and Keith Chris Christmas um, delivered to you earlier. We are running over time, but if I have two really burning questions out there, we'll take them. Sir, a microphone's coming to you, sir. Bonjour. Um, uh, my name is Eric Cameron, Swami First Nation, Manitoba. Um, I belong to, uh, we wrote the First Nation Land Managers Act and we passed our land code in 2010. And we also belong to the Manitoba, Manitoba Husky, which is a, a association of uh, National Average Land Managers Association. I haven't heard them being mentioned here once, but there's a, there's a toolkit training that the uh, National Alberta Land Managers Association offers to uh, land managers across Canada. And you don't have to be a, a land code band, you, or you just have to be in some regime like RLAMP or one of the regimes, and you can take these toolkit trainings. Some of them are additions to training, introduction to land management, land regimes, land use planning, commercial leasing, designation, environmental management. What I'm just getting at here is maybe uh, they can collaborate. Uh, University of Saskatchewan uh, offers a certain land manager, professional land manager uh, management certification program, and now Goma just joined, and now you have uh, Victoria and <coughs> IU. Uh, maybe they can collaborate in, in order to do this uh, guardian training. Thank you, sir. I think that's part of your concept paper, isn't it, Frank? This, or was it Keith, the, the assessment of what exists currently? This would fit in, would it not? Could I have a mic over here for Frank, please? I want to thank uh, Miles for dropping the bomb. Uh, that's what the ILI does, is provides leadership. And I really appreciate that. That's the, the truth of it. As we begin to move forward and we're... No matter what happens as we go forward, with or without Canada, you know, think about the, who we are, or with or without anybody, about our responsi responsibilities to land and water stewardship. We're gonna continue to do this work, irregardless. And, and we could cobble together these programs that have been talked about, whether it's a fisheries program or this guardian program, if that becomes the demise of it. That's why we have leadership, to paint the big picture and create the vision and give a, uh, Give us workers the chance to press it, see if we can make it happen, to roll it out. It's always one thing to put the concept out there, but another thing to give effect to it and implement it. And I have every confidence in the ILI to continue to advance this and give Canada the opportunity to, to participate in something that's gonna be quite amazing to come into the room and be with us and do this amazing work, which will be a global example. There's no other place, it was said, there's no other place that this can happen. Indigenous protected areas led by indigenous people. Again, it's up to us. And I, I appreciate that. I appreciate the good work and uh, it's been an honor and my privilege to be able to support this work because it's not about us. It's about our future generations. So 
So I appreciate this, the transparency and the clarification about the work that's before us, the challenges. We stood on the abyss of annihilation because of the colonial forces that coveted the lands and the water and the resources within it. But we're still here. A powerful demonstration of resiliency. And we have to lay the path for our next generations. I have two mics, thank you. Thank you, Frank. Um, we'd like to also go to Miles for a comment. Hello. Hello. So thank you for that, Frank. That, that whole, the whole team's been doing amazing work, as you can see in this conference here. But to you, sir, I just wanted to follow up on your comment. The base of our strength is our nationhood. And only we can define that. That's not up to anybody else to define but our own people and authorized by our own people. We're the holders of treaties. We're the holders of our title and rights. It's only up to us to define what those are in terms of who our people are and who our territory is. So we're gonna, each of us is gonna have to figure out how to do things like you just suggested, to take your existing initiatives, like whether it's a finance act or a governance arrangement or a fisheries agreement or a mining agreement, and roll it into this initiative of, of because the basis of your guardian's authority in your territory is your nationhood, is your own law, however we see that. Not federal law, not provincial law, your people's law, indigenous law. And it's up to you to, to define that. And you know, we, even if we come up with, can, if, and I think there's a good chance Canada may still come forward with a significant contribution to a Guardians network. But even if they do that, it's still up to each of our nations to, to define and put in place our own nation governance and we can support that through these initiatives but it won't cover it all up we're gonna have to find ways of doing that so I think your comment is very appropriate and you know I think that's why we have so much strength in our regional affiliations and then if we could come together from time to time at the national level I will transform this country in a really good way Thank you, Miles. Our last question is over on this side. Hi, I'm Lena Collins, Beacon Nation Guardian. Just wondering, uh, regarding a concept paper, I was just wondering, uh, is that, that something that we can add to? And also, uh, regarding our nation's direction, is that what my understanding is? And the other thing is, if, and what our concerns are um, with the concept paper for our nation, and then who do we address it to and who oversees uh, what we put forward? And yeah, just any, and what our concerns are. V very important question. When I was talking about the concept paper, I'm talking about the one that is on the website for the Guardians Network. Val, could you refer us to that? In that concept paper is an is a outline of governance. The one that, were, that Frank and Keith presented was a, was a paper around e education training. and training. That's a specific activity that we could potentially work together on. We'll identify those who, who, um, who uh, want, wish to work together, analyze the regional affiliations, and um, decide if we want to have any agreement or, or common approaches at the national level. In that paper, there was a lot of talk about examples in British Columbia and, and Vancouver Island University has been um, really actively involved. It's not going to be very, very um, practical for Vancouver Island University to deliver programming in Nova Scotia. You know, so I think that's why the three 
the, the Guardians Network level, the regional network level, and the national level are so important because we can build partnerships. And I, I would envision in that area um, common training and curriculum that's available as an option that we could develop at a national level that we could fine tune regionally and deliver on the ground. And we could have partnerships with every university in this country. I know every university in BC is, is actively involved, but I, there's a lot of interest across the country in getting involved, but we need to control what it is we're, we're teaching and learning. And the other question you asked, ma'am, was around governance. Who makes the decisions? Who do we put the, this into? Um, the results of this meeting will go up on the website, pal. The ilinationhood.ca website, and there's a Guardians Network section on there. And the, the governance paper, the, the concept paper, was the one that was as a result of our last national gathering, our discussion in Ottawa. That's what's brought us to here. After this discussion, it'll be updated and it will be the input to the regional discussions. That's where you'll have your main opportunity for input and to change it. it you know, it's meant to be a consensus. It's meant to be an, where we agree. And we only have to keep track of what we agree on. That, that would be the basis of this network. So the next major opportunity to do that will be at the regional gatherings. And those must take place this summer. Somehow we're going to have we're, we're going to raise that money before then. Thank you, Miles. Now um, you got anything to add? Those are really important questions. Yeah, thanks, Miles. On our web, our website is just up now on the screen. Um, there is a way to contact us directly. We will follow up with every one of you who contacts us. Of course, the whole idea of this is to have your input and, and your guidance in how to do this. So please get in touch with us. Again, Miles, as Miles said, we are gonna do our best to do those regional processes. There's also some thinking in your packages about, about where this is going. We do wanna create an indigenous-led network and, and that's gonna take some work. And, and of course, right now, the discussions have been based on, on a couple gatherings here and individual discussions and of course, at our table, you know, we've been having deep, deep, deep discussions about all of this for a very long time. Um, and we could very much benefit from, from your input. In fact, that's the whole idea of the design of this gathering, was to lift this up and create a context where you are a part of this movement and, and we need your help. And so please, yes, get in touch. We want to make sure this works with your leadership, works with you. And uh, we're not all about creating something that, that is going to be imposed on, on anyone. On the contrary, this is about building on your own sovereignty, your own power, and your own responsibility, and the network serving that. It's, that's very good. It's about what, it's mostly, a, you know, every nation, we have to respect each other's sovereignty in our territory. You, you get involved as you wish to get involved, as you see benefit in getting involved. And so, um, Okay now, let's not get carried away. What's happening here? <laughs> Chair, up here. <laughs> Thank you. Miles? I, I don't know, I got 10 thoughts in my mind. I'm trying to keep under your thumb. <laughs> you know, this, this, you is, try this, harder. Is, this try has harder. evolved so beautifully. You know, you look up in the Northwest Territories, you look at the Dacho present, <coughs> presenters. You know, three years ago, they, they had, a, a notion of a guardians program and they've identified their desire to do this, they pulled it together. You heard their young leaders sitting right in the same chair as me, I think, talking about all the progress they've made over the past few years. You know, the Dene Nation is in the Northwest Territories. They got five regions, the Dacho and then the Sawtu. They're all around Great Bear Lake. They're all doing their own thing and we said, Nationhood is the basis of this Guardians Network, but you have to do that work. 
They have done such, the Grand Chief, is he still in here? They have done such, a, the Satu have done such amazing work around Great Bear Lake and they've come together and they're building their Guardians Network based on their, their Satu inherent authority. You know, it's, I see it in Winnipeg, all the Guardians that came from, from around Lake Winnipeg. You know, it's just, and, and that's just from all their effort coming together and, you know, we're trying to, to coordinate regional, like, provincial and, and um, NGO support, but that's all, we, we have no authority. We can only help, and if, if you call people in, and, and we're trying to set up this decision-making process over this money in a way that reflects that, but that is going to be the, one of the key discussions at the regional gatherings. What would work for you? And our test is to get every dollar we can, not to be tied up in some bureaucracy in Ottawa, but to get it down to the Guardians uh, programs. At a national level, it's not a program. Don't, the only programs that exist are the ones you define in your nation. At a national level, it's a network. It's not prescriptive. Thank you, Miles. So the concept paper, the governance concept paper is on the ILA, ILA, ILA website. ILI. You, Thank you. If you can't find it, call Valerie. <laughs> Turn his mic off. If you can't find her, call me. Turn his mic off. Thank you. <laughs> Trying to get to the end here. Thank you. There's still lots of opportunity for you to put your information, your concerns, and your input in. This isn't, this isn't the last, this is not the last that you will hear of all, all of this. Thank you. We'd like to say thank you to this panel. Um, I know I'm calling Julie up. Are we wanting Neil? No, okay. So let's just say thank you to these two gents. And apologies, we're over time. What can I say? Thank you, gentlemen. Um, I would like to ask Julie and Loretta to come up here. I understand you have special thank yous that you would like to have. And they've promised to be quick. Stay right up here. So good evening and uh, thank you so much for everybody's attention and participation in this beautiful gathering that we were honoured to be able to prepare and for the wise words of guidance forward as well. Thank you so much. But one of the things that's really critical in uh, an event like this is the people behind the scenes. And on behalf of the Indigenous Caucus, I would like to um, acknowledge our staff who have worked so diligently over the last six months, I'll say, and especially the last week or week and a half, and they continue to do the work as we speak to make sure that everybody is moving around across the country and getting home safely and uh, getting their work, their, their documentation to them. So uh, we'd like to express our gratitude to, to the staff of the Secretariat. If we could call upon Carol Kavanaugh, Melody, to come on up, Virginia, uh, uh, Julie Cody. Gates, Cody, Cody Samuelson, and Audrey Camonfour Jabin, and Ashley Racine. And we have Odile, uh, who's at uh, headquarters, who's uh, getting ready to do all your travel claims. <laughs> we couldn't leave a gathering like this without thanking the people who supported us to pull it all together. So could you give them a big round of applause? So if you see them in the hallway as you're departing from this event, please give them a warm thank you.
Much gratitude. Thank you, sir. They did a fantastic job, and this would not be possible without all of them. And I know they don't like the limelight, but I think it was important that this was quite an endeavor, and they did a fantastic job. Thank you so much for all the hours, people. You can come over this way and shake our hands. Thank you. Thank you so much. Amazing people jumping to do whatever they can, interpret and whatnot on the spot. Thank you so much. And dance all night at the same time. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Let's have another warm round of applause for those fabulous people who did that wonderful work for you. We're almost there, people. I'd like to call upon Valerie for closing remarks, and then we'll be calling upon our dear elder. All right. Thanks, Leah. I'm going to keep this brief, but of course we have to uh, um, continue to think uh, what made this possible. You know, this is this is, by the way, the largest event that the Canadian Wildlife Service has ever sponsored, just to note how, how significant this is. Um, so, so many thank you. First, I want to thank all of you for being here. To the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil you First Nations for your welcome and your stay on our territories. Thank you to our spiritual leader, Dave Corshain, for his guidance throughout this. I want to note the presence of so many elders and, and, and youth in the room. I was really pleased to see so many young faces. Thank you to our elders and youth for being here with us during this gathering. Uh, I want to thank the senior advisors and my colleagues at the ILI. Thank you very much. Our partners for the this event, of course, Environment and Climate Change Canada, and, and, and in particular the Canadian Wildlife Service. And, and I want to note the leadership of, of Dr. Niall Day. Um, the members of the ILI Joint Working Group and the Secretariat, of course, who you just saw in front. Thank you to our special guests, Premier Horgan, Grand Chief Ed John, um, and of course our Australian guests, Dennis and Aaron. Thank you so much for making the journey all the way from Australia. And by the way, their flights were booked like literally days ago. And Dennis had just been to Canada on a tour, a two week long tour, two weeks ago. So real trooper for Dennis for making the trip again. Thank you very much. To our amazing presenters, moderators, to Pivey um, for the discussion paper and Pamela Perot for helping us prepare some of the written materials. Thank you so much. Thank you to our supporters, partners, and donors who made this night and, and their celebratory event last night um, possible. In particular, Grant, Regional Chief Terry TG of the BCAFN, Van City, IBCC, the B BC Ministry of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation, the Miaupuka First Nation in Newfoundland, the Inutekwegan Washatmak Maniutenam, Charles Coffey, who is the retired VP from RBC, Iron Orn, Quebec, um, I also want to just note, thank you for, for the wonderful performances last night. Wasn't that amazing? How many times have you been able to see Buffy and Cash and Bitterly Divine in the same night? That's, that's amazing. To our honorary guardians, Buffy and David Suzuki, welcome to the family and thank you for, for allowing us to honor you um, in this way and we hope to, to uh, count on your support um, ongoing. Leah, thank you so much for keeping us on time, for guiding us throughout this work and for your, I must say, your, your quiet but steady approach. It's very inspiring. I might have to learn on, on some of that. Thank you to the Wizard League Ginger Gosnell Myers and her team for the organization. She's behind a lot of this um, setup, uh, the hotels, the negotiation with the vendors, everything. Thank you so much, Ginger. Yeah. To Frank and Kathy Brown, and, and thank you for everything that you've done throughout this, everything from the from the necklaces to the ceremony, the dance, and, and your 
your special care and, 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 and approach to, to um, being a support here and organizing you know, the night at, uh, at the IMAX. That film was spectacular. To our communications team and filmmakers for the videos, Nation Talk, thank you for the live streaming the whole event. The recorded uh, version will be on our website and available on YouTube. Thank you to the Pinnacle Hotels for their welcome, the venue, the chefs, the great food. And uh, please, please, please keep in touch. Thank you to all of you for being troopers and sitting right through two days of intense presentations. Um, I hope that these conversations continue and that you stay in touch with you. And please, please, please have a safe home. And we'll see you at the next and hopefully even bigger and brighter gathering, national gathering. Thank you all very much. Thank you all, and to close us off in the same way that we began, we'd like to ask our dear elder to come join us. Bonjour, Ani. Dene magani tak migani akhi inindi go kinyo do tem sagi donji. You know, I want to keep with the spirit you know, that began or brought us together, you know, to, to come together and, and be the people that we really are. Because it shows what I have seen, you know, and being asked to be a witness in this gathering. I can see the dedication, the resilience, you know, and the passion of finding our way back home as a people. You know, I, I visit so many of our communities across the land, and we see the impact of the disconnect, you know, that colonization has brought into our environments. And one of the things I, I see very clearly, <clears throat> that there's a lot of loneliness in the communities. There's a lot of grieving that's going on. And I've thought about that, and I said, and I began to realize, that what our people are lonely for and what they're grieving about is they want to go back to the land. That's where they want to go. Because that is where life is. That is where the truth is, you know, that we're all looking for. And I want to acknowledge the spirit that was invoked through a ceremony. And I want to say to the spirit, I want to say to the Creator, I want to say to the Spirit of Mother Earth, I want to say to the grandfathers of the Four Directions, Kinanakuminanim, thank you. Whenever I use my language and I say Kinanakumin, that does not come from my mind. It comes from my heart of the deepness that I feel for the love of the presence of Spirit that comes to guide us and to inspire us, you know, to do the right things. We have to move beyond always trying to, you know, get involved in, in conflict and in confrontation. And we have to stand for something that is positive. We have to be able to stand up and to allow ourselves to be open to the spirit that is there to guide us to be the people that we are. I always remember a law that has come from our sacred lodges that I believe that this has to be the foundation of our, of our movement. And this law in our language we say, the great binding law of the creator should be the foundation of how we should proceed. You know, in the work that we need to do, and I, I've noticed, you know, in the gathering that there is a lot of diversity in terms of opinion and ways and means that we see, you know, that we can move forward as a people. But let me say this, that we should never allow ourselves, you know, to become separated or divided because we happen to, to have these different thoughts or different ways of doing things. Because at the end of the day, if we invoke the Spirit, you know, to guide us, they will lead us.
to the right things that need to be done. And I, I felt so much, you know, with the ceremony that was done by our people from this area, because there's uniqueness across the country, even amongst our people. And if you begin to, to participate in that uniqueness amongst our own nations, you begin to see what a beautiful people that we are, the richness of the knowledge and the passion that we have for life, the passion that we have for our children and the passion that we have for the land, because we know in our heart that whatever we're looking for that we call life is found on the land. And I've heard so many stories of the many different efforts that are being made to, to take care of the earth. And we have to be careful when we're talking to our young people and we talk about protection of the land. We're not talking physical uh, confrontation. How do we protect the land? We join an alliance with the spirit, you know, to guide us on the things that we need to do in order to, to take care of the land. We must never, never overstep the spirit in terms of finding resolution, vision that will guide us to the proper path. There's so much to be thankful for, so much. You know, some of the people that I met and shared some words with, I could feel that kindness that is so common in our people. We are a kind people. You know what? I'm always so proud of our people is that we know how to give and we know how to share. You know, if you look at the current reality of the land base that we're expected to survive is less than 1% of the, of the land base that our ancestors you know, were taken care of. But I also believe in prophecy that that land is going to come back to us. I totally, totally believe that. Because we need to show the people, our brothers and sisters that have arrived on our homeland, that they are rules of conduct that are universal in all of us on how to take care of the land. And we have to be very careful, you know, as a people, that we do not continue to go cap in hand with the colonizer expecting them to give us the resources that belong to us. The Spirit will bring it back to us. Whatever we need, as we define the vision on how to, to restore ourselves as a people. I learned something when I had a vision many years ago, when a vision of this beautiful place that we work out of today called the Turtle Lodge. And I was guided by the elders to go to the land, to sit on the land, to feel the land, to cry on the land, and ask the Creator for a dream. Help me. Because a dream will define your purpose and your meaning in life. This is where the effort should be put with our children, to take our young boys to the land so that they can feel the land and reach out to the Creator and say, give me a vision that will define my purpose and meaning to be a human being. And to take the young girls back to the sacred lodges of the grandmothers that teach them about their duty and responsibility in being a mother. We all have to take care of that life. Man has still yet to understand this very simple truth that Mother Earth is alive. And she is full of love. And we as a people have always reciprocated that love that the earth has given us by offering simple words of gratitude, saying thank you, Mother Earth. And the laws that we need to follow never take more from the land than what you need. And to live with the truth and understanding what you do to the land, you do to yourself. We're becoming sick. The animals are sick. The fish are sick because of us and the way that we have behaved and not knowing that the land is alive. Would, that, would you do that to your own mother? Would you poison your own mother? I think not. But why do we do it to the earth? Because we're disconnected from the earth. We're disconnected from the life, the life force that is there to, to give us life. When we talk about protection of the land, I see 
it in a different way. I say, let us teach our children, and I mean all children. I'm not only talking about First Nations children. If I had the power today, I would take all the young boys that have reached the stage of puberty and take them to the land, and I guarantee you the world will change. You will not see what you see today in, in the political environment and these legislations as men are behaving in a way that does not show respect for life, does not show respect for women. We see it every day. We need to take our children to the land. And let me say this, it doesn't take money to walk on the land. It does not take money to go and sit beside the river, the lake, the ocean, and to sit in the mountains, you know, to ask and for that spirit to give us the strength and the courage to be able to do the right thing. I was so touched with the movie when the, young, when the father took his son to be with the bear. That to me just filled my heart because that's what I believe we need to do. We need to take our children to go and be with nature, to go and see and feel those animals as they teach, as they teach us, because the animals are, are more than prepared to help us. Back where I come from, there are seven laws that we are inspired to live by, which is the foundation of life itself. I'll just give you one because we don't have the time, because I think it's important. The first law we were given was, was held and carried by the buffalo. What did the buffalo carry? The buffalo carried the spirit of respect. And the essence of respect is how to give. I remember going into a meeting one time and the, pres uh, the, the CEO of Manitoba Hydro, and I was asked, I said, go and talk to them. Because we were trying to find some help and resources to put the gathering of elders. And the, pre the CEO said to me, well, how much do you want? I said, I didn't come here to come and ask you for money. I came here to give you an opportunity to give. That's what I came here for. And that's what we need to do with the people of the world. Give them an opportunity to give. Do not go cap in hand with anybody or seek validation from anybody that may have the resources that we feel that we need because ultimately, the Creator will give us everything that we need in order to fulfill the dreams that each of us may have. We have a collective vision as a people, and that is to, to create a world that is peaceful, that is sharing and giving. We need to bring that spirit back. When I had breakfast this morning with Frank and we talked about the, this whole powerful spirit of giving and the potlatch. And we have the same similar ceremony back home where we're constantly giving so that we never forget the power of giving. That is how you get life back, by giving. But we live in a selfish world and we've forgotten how to give. All these, these challenges we, may, we have. And I heard uh, something yesterday that I really really enjoyed hearing and it was said in the most simple way. Let us put our moccasins and, start, and walk on the land again. That's a powerful statement, that to walk on the earth again. Using the moccasins, which is a very powerful way of saying things. And I heard another, and I always look for these one-liners that I could take with me wherever I go. I love some of these one-liners. As one individual said, we have the capacity as a people to set our own course. That sets it all. We have the capacity to be able to set our own course. And you know what? A lot of people say, well, we, we're, we're a minority in our homeland. And I say, we are not a minority in our homeland because we have an alliance with nature that the trees are our brothers and they walk with us. We have an alliance with the fish, and they swim with us. We have an alliance with the eagles, the birds, that are there to carry our message 
to the Creator. What a powerful way of life. Why do we always minimize ourselves by taking it down to a level that is not of our understanding as a people? When I tried to fulfill my dream of building a lodge, I made a big mistake. I chased the money for, and I met some very wealthy people. I met, some, met a lot of famous people, and I was trying to encourage them to give me money to build a lodge. It never happened. I came home, and I, I said, I have to go to ceremony and tell the creator, you, I must have passed someone by someone that you really wanted to choose to build this lodge, because I can't do it. Then I went into a fast, and the Spirit says to me, why are you not building the lodge? And I responded, because I don't have any money. And the Spirit said, did your ancestors need money before they built their lodges? Did your people need money to survive? And of course, the answer was no. And they said, well, what are you waiting for? We built the lodge. Without the money, you know, that, that I thought we needed, that came naturally. A vision will happen if you have faith and believe in it. If you need money, that'll come. It'll come to you. But the most important part of it was the human resources that are needed, you know, that believe in your dream that comes from a higher power. That's what we need to teach our children, to believe in themselves, to love themselves, to empower them by taking full responsibility that we have been given by the Creator and to teach our children about all the good things in life because there's a lot of good things. There's a lot of good things. And if you go to the land, that is where you're going to really feel the good things that nature has to offer. Mother Earth is waiting for us and has always been there for us, to teach us. We have to create that kind of support for our children, create our own institutions, whatever that are, whatever that is. But it has to be led by us in alliance with the Spirit, guided by the Spirit. And we will teach the world, we will teach the world about how sacred that all life is. And we will share with them the rules of conduct and the laws that should be the foundation of how we should be treating each other as human beings. I want to thank my, also, you know, the, the people that put all this effort to bring us together. Because a lot of work is done. A lot of people are needed. And certainly, you know, being one of the members of ILI, I know that our role is to offer advice. You know, I didn't see myself coming into this, you know, to be administering anything or managing anything. I've done that already in my younger life. I, I, I enjoy my role more in offering guidance. Guidance that we cannot impose on anyone, but rather, hopefully, that people will be inspired by some of the things that we say. I've been meeting with some of the members of, you know, the ILI, and you know, we, we talk about bigger dreams. Where are we gonna take this now? What are we gonna do? And certainly the number one issue that seems to be facing our world today is climate change. And we're gonna put a lot of effort into that. Whatever that's gonna take in order to address that whole issue of climate change, which is everything. It's everything. But we have to unconditionally support the people that are putting all these efforts and creating an initiative like the guardianship that we're there to help you. We're there to do whatever we can. So we, we have a lot of work that we need to do. Let us never find ourselves to be divided because we may have different approaches. Let us never, ever, ever reach that point. Because if we reach that point of not being able to work together, then we will have failed in what the creators expect from each of us and that is to be able to work together. I just want to say a final prayer in my language to, to the Spirit, you know, for everything that we have been blessed with in this, this short time that we've been able to gather. 
And in prayer, also ask for each and every one of you to find your way back home in a safe way, that you are all your children, your grandchildren be given all the love because of, you know, many of you have sacrificed your time to be here. And your children, you know, at home, they want you. They want to be with their grandparents. They want to be with their aunt and their uncle. So let us think about them. And finally, I want to thank Frank and his wife, Kathy. I see the work that you do. I see your dedication. And thank you for giving me this honor that you gave me to, to be a witness here in this gathering. Miigwech. Thank you. Thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs>